that we should be very concerned. Um, but not always for, for the reasons we assume we should be concerned. I know there has been a recent uh, controversy, oh, that Nigeria has signed away its sovereignty to China and so on. Um, I think that's a bit sensational, uh, and I'll come to that in a minute. But let's go back to the facts. China has lent African countries anything between 100 and 200 billion dollars. It's probably nearer to 200 billion. Now, over the last 20 years or so, as you know, China is a rising world power and it is looking to establish what we call a Sinosphere, um, a sphere of influence in a number of continents, in Asia, very close to its borders, in Africa, and in Latin America, especially these three parts of the world. And it is today the second biggest economy in the world after the United States. So it is a rising power. And every rising power, one of the indices of power is client states in international relations. I mean, states that owe some sort of allegiance to you for one reason or the other. It could be ideological, or it could be for commercial ties or aid, or whatever it is. So China is fairly seeking to make Africa a spare, has made Africa, not seeking to, a sphere of influence through a combination of loans, trade, and aid. So it's in that context that we have to look at the relationship between Africa and China. Now, many of these African countries have behaved like abused spouses. Um, why do I say so? When a spouse is abused, and when I mean a spouse, it could be a man or a woman, don't get me wrong. Um, the next person, that smiles at the person, you think, oh, my spouse abused me, this person likes me. So maybe I'll be better off with this person than with the old spouse or with the present spouse. This is the psychology that led Africa into the embrace of China because African countries were frustrated with their relationships with the Western world and felt that China was now offering them support unconditionally, quote-unquote, unconditionally, not asking questions about human rights violations, uh, not asking any ideological questions, just business to business. And a lot of African leaders like that sort of transactional approach uh, to, to, um, to, to things. So many countries have gone, and, and of course, China also sweetened this approach by making Africa feel that we were brothers. There was a solidarity. Uh, between the two of us against the West. You see? So African countries felt China was more aligned with them in terms of global worldview experience, um, in terms of resentment of Western colonization or Western imperial influence. And so they jumped from frying pan into fire, in my view. So that's the background in terms of the relationship between Africa and China broadly. Now with COVID, with the coronavirus, Many of these loans that China has, on, has given out under its Silk and Belt um, initiative have gone back. And many countries in Africa are not able to pay for these loans. And so for the first time, China has had to uh, defer or cancel some of these loans. So, but that's because of the extraordinary circumstances of the coronavirus. Coming to Nigeria specifically, Nigeria is owing China officially, according to the Debt Management Office, the DMO, $3.1 billion. So that's the total uh, stock of debt. Um, and, um, you know, Nigeria's total debt is about $90 billion, of which foreign debt is $35 billion. So this $3.1 billion is 3% of Nigeria's total debt and about 10% of Nigeria's foreign debt. What are the terms of these loans? On the face of it, they look very attractive. They are concessional loans, 2.5% annual interest, payable over 20 years, a tenor of 20 years, and with a seven-year moratorium. So if you look at this kind of deal on the surface, 
it looks good. But when you go deeper, there are many problems. The number one problem, the number one problem is not a problem just about Nigeria's loans to China. The number one problem is Nigeria's broader external indebtedness. Nigeria is essentially walking into a sovereign debt crisis. When you consider that we now spend virtually all that we earn servicing foreign debt. Let me give you an example to illustrate this. In quarter one of 2020, that's the period from January to March, Nigeria's total, federal government's total retained revenues were about 950 billion um, um, naira. But we spent 943 billion servicing external debt. That's about 99%. Out of every one naira the federal government of Nigeria earned, it spent 99 kobo servicing debt. Is a country that is on this kind of path fiscally viable? I think not. Um, we're taking more and more of these loans, and we're told by the debt management office that it's all okay. Our debt to GDP ratio is under control, is below 30%. But that doesn't matter. What matters for a country like Nigeria is the debt service to GDP ratio. What portion of your revenues, uh, sorry, debt service to revenue ratio. What portion of your revenue are you spending servicing debt? That's what matters. Not debt service to GDP, especially because our tax to GDP ratio is very low. Taxation doesn't form part of our revenues in any serious sense. It's just about 6%, one of the lowest in Africa and in the world generally. So what is our revenue? It's basically oil. And especially when you look at the, uh, the, the, the foreign currency part of that revenue, 90% of it is, is from oil, crude oil sales. So when those uh, revenues are plunging, then that's a huge risk but your debt obligations are fixed. So if there's a, such a serious mismatch between what you're earning and what you have to pay those you're owing, then you have a crisis. And that's what's the real problem for Nigeria today with its loans from China. I can go into other aspects. There are at least seven or eight major problems that I think we should bear in mind when looking at Nigeria's loans from China. If you want, I can go ahead. If you want me to stop and you have anything to say or questions, that's fine. Uh, um, thank you very much for this um, fine introduction, Prof. We are happy that you have given us this um, background. Now, one of the issues that have come up recently is the terms of those loans we are receiving. Let yeah. me give an example of... Uh, let me give an example of one of those terms that Nigerians are, con are concerned about. Yes. One of the loans obtained by Nigeria from China for railway, reconstru railway construction in the country, one of the clause have this to say, the borrower, Nigeria, hereby irrevocably waives any immunity on the grounds of sovereign or otherwise for itself or its property in connection with any arbitration proceeding pursuant to Article 8.5 thereof, with the enforcement of any arbitral award pursuant thereto, except for the military assets and diplomatic assets. Now, the public reading of these clause is that if for any reason Nigeria fails to pay back this loan, China will be, Nigeria will be ceding her sovereignty to China. Well, let me stop here. Let me allow you to give your own interpretation of this clause. Okay. Um, of course, I think any layman reading that um, would be concerned. But I want to caution that there may be a bit of sensationalism here. Um, there are, first of all, Nigeria tries to be prompt and punctual in servicing its external debt obligations even to the extent that they are included as part of the budget's recurrent expenditure. In that sense, Nigeria 
at least for a creditor, is not a bad borrower. Whether that is a good thing for the citizens of Nigeria is, of course, a different discussion. But we are now talking about the terms relative to the borrower and the lender. So that's number one. They do try to pay. Number two, the Nigerian officials will argue that what they pledge the full faith and credit of Nigeria, not the specific assets of the projects for which the loans are meant. Some countries pledge those assets in case they default. So Nigeria will tell you that you know, they protect themselves by relying more on their full faith and credit rather than um, you know, just pledging the assets for which the, the loan was borrowed. Third, specific to the language you have used, I think it is not an unusual language in the context of international debt. It's a language of transaction because the Chinese have to have a way to get their money back in case you default. I have anybody, a question. Anybody who is lending money must have a way of getting his or her money back if it's a proper legal commercial transaction. So what has happened here is that basically Nigeria is saying that if there's a problem and they go to arbitration, you don't know what the arbitral tribunal will award China as a way of getting its money back. But there has to be something that China can use to get its money back. So it may be a roundabout uh, way of looking at it, and you can say that the result is the same, but I think it's more of a language of transaction. But it's also part of that risk exposure uh, to which we put ourselves by the needless, in my view, my humble opinion, needless and excessive foreign borrowing uh, into which um, Nigeria is, is going. Um, so, the, but I think that the real problem with Nigeria's loans to China is not so much that clause, sensational as it is. And of course, we must bear in mind that in some countries like Zambia, like Kenya, like Sri Lanka, the Chinese have seized or attempted to seize national assets to get back its money. In China, in, in Zambia, for example, they have a foreign debt of about $8 billion. It's a small country. But about 90% of that foreign debt is owed to one country, China. So, so these are the things that I talk about. The absence of a world view among African countries. They always look at things just transactionally. They think only about the short term. We want to solve a problem. Uh, it is, and when we solve this problem, politically, we will be in good shape with the masses. So we don't care about tomorrow. Let's just do what we can to get our hands on some money now to create an illusion that we are fixing our problems. So the real problem, as I was saying, is that when you borrow from China, it is really the Chinese economy more broadly that you are servicing. You're servicing Chinese exports. You're acquiring Chinese exports because there's no transparency in these loans. So everything will come from China. The supplies, the company that will construct the project, the workers, that is where the problem is. So this becomes a way for the Export Import Bank of China to promote Chinese exports by, by saying they're lending you money. They're doing much more than lending you money. You must still pay back that money and the interest. On top of that, you provide so much more additional benefit to the Chinese economy, but not necessarily to yours, because we have to go into the discussion of how use, useful these foreign loans are, even though we are told they're for infrastructure. How viable are these infrastructure projects economically? Has anybody done a cost-benefit analysis? These are the questions we should be uh, asking ourselves. And what are the costs of these contracts? There are concerns about that as well, that the contracts in Nigeria are so high. When you compare them to similar contracts in a place like Ethiopia, but it's the same China 
that is being borrowed from. The question is why? So that's my answer to the question. Thank you very much. For those who are raising up their hand, we will get to uh, taking questions, but that will be in the next nine minutes. Until the next nine minutes, I will be the only one asking questions, if you'll pardon me. <laughs> okay. My next, question, my next question in this regard will be, given your concerns now, especially with the large amount of loan that Nigeria has accumulated over the years, can Nigeria afford to take more loans? I don't think so. Uh, but um, governance failures uh, seem to make the government think it has no choice but to take more loans. Now, I'm not condemning borrowing totally. There are times when a nation has to borrow. But the question is, one, what you do with what you borrow, and two, the terms and the transparency uh, of those terms on which you are borrowing. So um, I don't think we should continue to borrow. I think Nigeria should cut its you know, coat according to its cloth, but it keeps borrowing because we don't want to take hard decisions. We want to continue to maintain a bloated governance cost and, and civil service and so many things. So we want to maintain those things so that the government will be quote unquote popular with the people. Oh, what happens if we do something about cutting the costs of the size of, this, of the public service? You know, so this is the problem. And some of the loans that have been borrowed have been for budget deficit purposes. It's not, it's not even for infrastructure, but even the ones for infrastructure. What's the cost benefit analysis? Are there not ways of financing the uh, construction of railroads in Nigeria based on, say, public private partnership arrangements? If you can make a choice of locations that is based on economics. But if you don't make a decision based on economics, but you make a decision like that, only create an economically unviable project for which you have borrowed. Meanwhile, you may be pretending to the citizens that that uh, project is earning revenue. The, let's take the um, Abuja Kaduna Rail, Railway, for example. Two problems. Um, the rail line. That's number one. Number two it is being subsidized by the government, up to 60%. So, so this is the problem. You know, if you were to say, we will construct a project based on public-private partnership, a private investor will do it, and will tow the project. And we have costed this whole plan, and the income from the tolls or the passenger fares or whatever, um, will cover the costs over 20 or 25 years. And for that period, that company that constructed it owns it. What does that matter? The citizens are getting the service and they're paying for it. So I think the Nigerian government needs to move much more along the lines of PPP rather than borrowing to say they're constructing infrastructure. Of course, we know that you know, the Nigerian context Awarding contracts is something that politicians like. Uh, but I think it's time for us to uh, take a, a bit more sensible and longer term approach to these things. Um, uh, Prof, thank you very much. In as much as you have touched it uh, briefly on, on, your last, on your last answer to my last question, I would still like to bring it up again. Now, yes. seeing that we have these concerns yes. about all these loans and also seeing that we don't have enough money to finance our infrastructural needs in the country. What yeah. are those hard decisions that you think we should be taking now rather than taking more loans? Since you've already given the opinion that we shouldn't be taking additional loans on top of what we have already. What tough decisions do you think we should be? One, shift more towards a PPP approach for viable economic projects. And then you can save money that you can use to construct projects in rural areas. That's number one, an economic decision. Number two, which is a political decision or a decision that requires political will, we have to cut the cost of governance. 
Because if you're spending over 90% of every revenue you're earning servicing foreign debt, you are essentially bankrupt. But you are postponing your bankruptcy to be handled by future governments and the citizens. So we are transferring to future generations a burden that we're not sure how able Nigeria will be to carry that burden because we don't know the future. If, if oil prices continue to decline and we don't have any other, we don't have a, a productive economy that is export oriented to earn us foreign exchange, then you could have a situation where there could be an internal implosion because don't forget that based on the revenue um, fiscal arrangement in the Nigerian constitution, the federal government uses the oil money to distribute to various levels of government which means that in reality, we are not a federal government, a federal country. That's a unitary approach where the, where the, where the, the, uh, the federal government, the central government owns all the resources that come from the country, including some that come from mineral resources in parts of the federation, whether it's solid minerals or whether it's oil. But in a proper federation, those revenues should go to the parts of the country that cover that area. And then they pay a tax on those revenues to the federal government because the federal government must be functional and somebody must sustain it. You see what I'm saying? So these are some of the hard decisions. One, PPP arrangement. Two, cut the cost of governance. Three, move to a proper federation, what we call constitutional restructuring. Nigeria is not economically, and I dare say even politically, viable in the absence of a constitutional restructuring of the federation back to a real federal constitution. Without it, the country has very little um, you know, hope of a bright future. Thank you very much, Pro. Uh, I think in view of the large number of participants we are having today, more than we used to have, I will have to cut down on my questions and allow our guests to put their questions. And please, because of also the large number of people who have indicated that they will want to ask questions, Please, we will not entertain comments. We won't want you to give your own comments on the topic. Just ask questions, please, so that everybody, let's see how, how much of the questions we will have to take prop from Prof, because it is not uh, always that we have someone like Prof around. So like the boys will say, let us get all the fruits we need from Dodgy, because uh, we don't know where we are having him back. <laughs> so um, let's take the first question from Peters. Okay, Jared, please. If you can unmute yourself and ask your questions, please, as brief as you could make it. Peters, okay, Jared, please. If you can unmute yourself and also start your video. Peters, okay, Jared. Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Um, Otumba, Olabode, please, Osiana, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Um, my question will uh, be related to, to you. Uh, I, I look back at your career, very, very impressive, and uh, very also to note that not many people like you uh, have the opportunity of getting to where you are. And that, that's a statement of fact. Having said that, uh, all this problem Nigeria is having, and uh, a study that is now taking its toll on Nigerians, uh, you are someone who had, had the opportunity of uh, serving Nigeria, and also at the last general election that you uh, wanted to run, I mean, you ran for uh, office of presidency. Uh, the question is, with all the information, with all the education, with everything, exposure and so on and so forth you have, did you not think if you have started at a level of maybe a senator or some other area, will have been, Nigeria will have been better served? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Daniel, do you want me to answer that? Or, um, this is not part of our program, please. Well, uh, I, 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 I was about to say that this is not exactly related to... Exactly. Uh, yeah, the topic. Uh, the, the, yeah. The, 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 okay, okay. Uh, the, uh, Dan, you see, you made a lot of uh, 
uh, you allude to Igbo uh, proverbs, like, uh, uh, which is fantastic, you know. Yoruba people say when you lose words, when you have to uh, uh, talk about certain things, you look for a uh, proverb, uh, 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 proverb that are related to it. You see, also in Yoruba, people say you cannot cook a, 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 a dog. You want to fry a dog, you must be ready to to take to spend time with the with the fat. Otumba, the fat Otumba, we have very limited time, time, please. We have been very very limited. Yeah, time. But, okay, uh, okay. Let, for let, instance, for uh, let, um, Daniel, Daniel, out yes. of respect to our uh, compatriots, uh, Otumba, let me just very briefly. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, you know, I'll be glad if we kind of keep the questions to the subject matter and the yes. economy and things like that. Yes. I don't think we're here to discuss politics. Um, although, of course, there's a relationship between the politics of Nigeria and Thank its economy. You. So that's, yeah, that's, also, where I'm, that's where I'm coming from, yeah. Thank yes, you. Yes, that's, that's also true. So now, very quickly, you asked a question. Why didn't I run for Senate or something like that? Okay, let me answer you. You see, um, people engage. I never planned to enter politics, and I'm not a career politician as I'm sure you can see. I, I ran for president just out of my frustration with the situation in Nigeria. Personally, I have done very well in life. I can afford to turn my back on Nigeria and live my life. You see what I'm saying? But I chose not to because my love of my country made me feel that I should get engaged. So I decided to get engaged at the level of my interest, my preparation, the relevance of my experience, which has always been national and international. So I am more used to dealing at the national level and at the international level. And also that is really where my vision is. It doesn't mean that being a senator doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that being a governor doesn't matter. Those things also matter. But we say in Igbo, onion and care, onion and care, each man his own. You have your own interests, and you don't, nobody can manufacture an interest you don't have. You see what I'm saying? So I went for what I was interested in, and I believe I added value in that context because I gave out a national vision and a plan for Nigeria that if it were to be followed, there would be a big difference in Nigeria within four or five years. No question about that. And many people would say, that that's an important contribution that you have made. Practically, let me answer you. How many people are in the Senate? 100. What has changed in Nigeria? You think it's because there are no intelligent people there? It's not because of that. So that's my answer. We, we thank you very much. Let's proceed immediately to take, uh, please, subsequently, only questions related to the topic, and please make it as brief as possible. Let's take a question from Charles Ude, please. If you can unmute yourself, Charles. Yeah. Prof, uh, I salute you. I'm very pleased to see you again. Thank you. Uh, you've been doing a great job. My question is very simple. Um, is the Ministry of Finance the right people that should be presiding over such contracts? When you look at the content, or things that are content, you know, in terms of those contracts. You know, that's one question on the side. You know, because I feel that if you use the right people, maybe the normal contract remedies should apply. Before the Chinese people can even take over any assets, I was saying my thoughts are that our courts should first determine if there are breaches. Before we, you know, so I just wanted to clarify that aspect for me, uh, Prof. Thank you. The first thing I want to tell you is that many investors um, in Nigeria do not have any confidence in the judicial system in the country. Um, and because of that, most contracts that are entered with the country are subject to international arbitration. They are made subject to international arbitration because there's no assurance that the rule of law in Nigeria can be trusted to deliver an impartial efficient and effective outcome. So that's number one point you need to understand. Number two, since it's a financial obligation, it's not surprising that it's the Ministry of Finance that handles those um, you know, discussions. But I know that under you know, the debt 
especially the debt management office, because we have a, a professional debt management office. Never mind that in reality, I don't think they have a voice in, or their voice is respected in terms of the decisions politicians make. So it seems to me that the DMO, as it is today, exists simply to rationalize political decisions about borrowing um, and, and try to explain it away. For example, they keep telling us about debt to GDP, but they don't tell you about you know, revenue to debt service ratio, which is the real issue. You know, so that's why I said that the DMO um, doesn't seem to be able to influence the discussion in a way that is actually to the best interest of Nigerians. But we do have a DMO, and there are processes through which uh, these loans are negotiated and through which they go. One, they will not be signed if the attorney general of the federation has not reviewed the loan. So I don't think we should feel that people just go and sign anything. So the question then is, if the attorney general agrees to things we don't agree with, how do we hold the Attorney General accountable? But because, you see, there's no transparency in these negotiations. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what the Attorney General has seen. We don't know what he has signed. We don't know what comment he has made. And of course, there can be no external borrowing without the approval of the National Assembly. So these are the two checks. But does the National Assembly take these decisions based on politics or based on economics? Well, you know, the answer is uh, blowing in the wind. So th this is the question. That's, that's my answer to the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank we, you we thank you very much, Prof. We take another question immediately from Afiz Adebayo, please. Afiz, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Good evening, Mr. Dan. Good evening. I want to greet our respected Prof. That's my girl. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, all participants. Now, my question is straightforward. is uh, relating to the loan. Now, Prof, looking at the contents of the contract, okay, the clause in particular that we share stipulates that Nigeria is conceding or ceding its sovereignty to the Republic of China, should there be default relating to the project. Okay, now, as an expert, is there a reason for Nigerians to be concerned? That is one. Okay. Then, secondly, I want to ask Prof, if if you are in charge of the affair of this nation relating to this contract, what will you do differently, and how will you do it to the best interest of Nigeria and Nigerians? Thank you, sir. Well, first of all, um, that's a hypothetical, but let, let's, let me answer the question. Um, if I were to be the one, um, you know, deciding on, on these things, first of all, I would not go for those loans. I would reform the revenue system in Nigeria to give the federal government enough revenue in taxes, and there's so many unexploited possibilities. Even when we look at the question of taxation, you don't have to raise or increase taxes, but you can diversify your tax base. I have said it time and again, if you do an audit of the mobile telephone network in Nigeria, you will reach practically everybody. If you do a phone audit, you will know who owns what line, what their employment is, and whether that employment is taxable. You will bring a lot of people from the informal economy into the formal economy. Even if it's a small thing you're getting from them by tax, if you multiply it according to millions, there are at least 160 million mobile phone lines in Nigeria today. That's a fact. There are about 70 million people that we know should be paying tax. Only 10 million of them are. So you see, there's a huge gap that we can go to and get, even if it's 10, 10, or 100, or whatever it is. If you multiply that, the revenue from there is huge. So that would be my approach if I were to be, I would not be just looking for where to borrow money. No, I'll be looking for how to create wealth 
for the nation internally. So that's number one. Number two, if, if going beyond that, and I had to go into such a contract, I would negotiate it very differently. And the first thing I would insist on that contract, first of all, we would watch, we would do a, 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 um, a competitive bidding. I would not agree to borrow money from you and you must, your company must be the one to do the job. That's gone beyond borrowing money. And that is just trading your independence away. That's what it is. I would never get into a contract like that. So, and this is the problem that many African countries have with China. They are not able to assert themselves in negotiations with China. Let us say that I were to agree in any event that a Chinese company would build it. We will do a comparative cost analysis. We will go to Ethiopia and other countries and check the costs. And I would not allow that all the supplies and all the labor and everything has to come from China. It means that there's no real benefit for my own country when people are looking for jobs. When people are looking for jobs. So it's a question of the mindset you come to these discussions with. I think that's what matters. So I've taken you through a number of hypotheticals. One, would I even go, you know, massively borrowing uh, on behalf of Nigeria? No, I wouldn't. Because I would apply my mind to what are the alternatives. Because I know that the implications of these endless loans for the people of Nigeria are not necessarily the best. So this is, this is how I would look at it at various levels. We thank you, Prof. We have less than five minutes remaining for this discussion. So I'll call on Buje Daniel, please, to ask his question. If you'll quickly unmute yourself and ask your question. Buje Daniel, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Daniel, for giving me the opportunity. Sir, I, as a young person, I'm very concerned about some of the things you raised. And maybe these are the confusions that our leaders are failing to tell our people. One of them is the depth is the debt service to revenue ratio. You are absolutely right because last month, the Minister of Finance said the debt to ratio is 99%. But many Nigerians don't understand what it is. So what does it mean to have a good debt, a debt service to revenue ratio when taking loan? And sir, please explain why it is important that the principal the interest and a good accounting or auditing export revenue is important before you take a loan. I feel that when this is said, this will help us better understand. I clearly get your point, and I hope Nigerians are listening. Thank you, Hello uh, uh, Boss TV. This is a wonderful presentation, and God bless you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I think, you know, if I, if I got you uh, correctly, you know, on the question of revenue to debt service ratio. I explained it very simply. A ref revenue to debt service ratio of 99% means that if you, every one Naira you earn, 99 Kobo is going to servicing the loan, not even paying back the full loan, servicing. but mostly servicing the interest. So that's just not good. And I don't think it takes a lot of, it doesn't take rocket science to understand that this is not a good uh, situation. The World Bank tells us, you know, they are experts on these things, that the revenue to debt service ratio ideally should not be more than 22.5% for any country. So it's not a very good idea to be paying more than one quarter of any one naira you're earning servicing debt. So number two, before you borrow, you have to, look at the purpose for which you are borrowing and the economic viability. There is no thorough exercise I know that takes place in Nigeria assessing the economic viability and revenue potential of projects for, uh, for foreign loans. We have even seen that some of the foreign loans, $500 million that have been proposed to digitize NTA, and these types of things, you know. So you have to question about the economic viability. And that's why I say that we all need infrastructure. Everybody knows. 
But why don't you use the PPP approach instead of borrowing for every dollar you want? Nigeria is a huge country with 200 million people. Everybody knows it's a great market. If the enabling conditions were to be created, a lot of investors will come into that country, they will make money, but we too will get the benefits. You see what I'm saying? So it's not a country of uh, 500,000 people that investors have to worry. If I come and invest there, how do I get my money back? No. So it's a question of the political will of the government. It's a question of the competence of economic management, which determines the approach. But everything in Nigeria is managed from the basis of politics. There's very little rational thinking that goes into many of these decisions. They have decided mainly on politics. And when we, while we're on politics, let me say something. It is very interesting that virtually all of these projects are in two parts of the country or three parts of the country. There is no little or no uh, project in the southeast of Nigeria from these loans. Does it mean that the people of the southeast do not contribute any taxes to the federal government which are being used to pay these loans? You know the answer. It's, that's not true. They are being taxed. Can you have taxation without representation? Wasn't that what led to the Boston Tea Party and the revolution in America? So this is the thing. So everything is just about politics. And even when you are doing the politics, it's done in a certain way that is a bit skewed and creates more political problems. But the more important thing for me from an economic point of view, is the economic viability of the, of the projects and the economics of it all. The economics of it all is just not right to me. Um, but the politicians are our masters, so. Well, th thank you very much, Prof. We're gradually coming to the end of this conversation. So what we can do now is simply to take all the questions at once and then you use it to give your concluding comments, if you don't mind. Sure. So let's call on Bashir Medugu, please. Bashir, if you can unmute yourself, and ask your question, Bashir. Bashir Medugu, are you here? Can you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Yes, I am. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hear me hello, 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 Bashir. How are you? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Bashir. Hello, Maybe Bashir, go on. ahead. Okay. Oh, good. I'm I can fine. see you. Um, yes, I want to find out um, the sovereignty clause in the Chinese agreement. In the Chinese agreement, I vis a vis international law, you know. Okay. And uh, the concept of uh, non-intervention, and uh, even though Chinese and the Nigerians have, you know, entered into an agreement, I think those uh, international agreements shall be able to subsist uh, rather than the sovereignty clause that is inserted in the contract. I want to find out what uh, what is the relationship. Is it is it does it supersede the 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 international agreements or the international concept of? Uh, uh, sovereignty of countries? That is my question. Yeah. We thank you very much. Uh, let's also call on uh, Bob Manuel Echongu, please. Bob Manuel? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Lumba. Um, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful um, positions on these uh, loan issues. My question is uh, concerning the third party witness um, uh, issue in, in this loan arrangement with China. Um, see that um, Hong Kong is an annex uh, kind of of China. What are the risks we face if we have to go to international arbitration concerning this loan? Uh, how 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 does that play out in our favor or against us as uh, 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 Hong Kong being a third party in in this uh, loan arrangement? Thank you. We well, thank you. Also, we call on Othman Esatuchuku, please. If you can unmute yourself, Othman. 
Oh, good evening. Thank you very much, Daniel. I, I thank my boss um, and my role model, Prof, for having you this evening. Uh, my question is, uh, Prof, looking at the trajectory of Nigerian borrowing, uh, we, we, assuming without conceding we could not afford to repay this loan from China, what do you suggest or what do you advise the citizens of Nigeria to do in order to compel the government to stop growing us into uh, perpetual poverty because um, sovereignty belongs to the people and these guys does not even consult us they don't give us any room you know to suggest a way out for this country so what do you suggest the citizen should do to compel the government to stop borrowing thank you well thank you and your for Ozago, please And your photos are good, please. Lotanna. Lotanna's iPad. Hello? Okay. Hello? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? Can go ahead, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, um, Prof, thank you very much uh, uh, for your inputs. Uh, my thing is that uh, it's not just commonsensical that uh, a situation whereby in Nigeria, contract inflation is a norm. And even the projects that has been uh, uh, marked out for that that you know, for this for this loan seem to be highly inflicted. That the government should focus more energy in trying to cut down this inflation of contracts and other uh, wastes, uh, excesses like you mentioned. Instead of, uh, I mean, that's is that not a way to go? And uh, as part of tackling corruption, also because to borrow money. For a project that's already hyper inflicted, yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Thank you. We well, thank you very much. Um, Lotanna, you have Lotanna's iPad, please. Are you able to ask your question quickly? Quickly, please. Um, <clears throat> um, hi, everyone. So, my question is this um, Prof, you had, you had listed about three points or three ways you could approach this issue if you were to be the president of Nigeria, where you mentioned the PPP and all those points. Now, my, my question is, when you have just four years to do this and also prove a point for your re-election, because what usually happens is that the first two years is usually the one for, you know, settling the political allies and everything. And by the time they are done settling the political allies, they have another two years to prepare for the next term. So, what what time? I'll go pray. You, I'll go join her later. What, what time will you have to prepare for these things and also prove a point for your re-election? Because that's a realistic thing that we usually face in politics today. Right, Casey Mora, please, please, um, quickly, if we can have your questions quickly, Casey Mora. Okay, pro Prof, Prof Kessie here. Thank you so much for this. Um, yeah, my quick question is, um, given uh, the quagmire that the nation is in now, uh, we know that the economic viability of Nigeria, even the political viability, if we continue on this trajectory, uh, doesn't seem very um, good. What, what do you think would help? What can the National Assembly do what can this current government do to reverse some of these trends and help get Nigeria back on track? Okay, thank you. Obi Osuji, please. Obi Osuji. Obi Osuji, please. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, just a very basic question. Uh, Prof did say that um, what he's more concerned about is uh, economic viability of loans and um, that basically the uh, capacity of such loans or the projects uh, being attributed uh, tied to those loans being able to be paid back so I just, i'm asking a very basic question does he Paul, do you think that given the respective loans we've taken so far do they appear economically viable indeed to repay for these loans to be repaid or are we going to be sourcing other are we going to be looking out for other sources to repay those loans and not from the projects itself well, thank you. Philip, please. Philip. Yeah. Hello, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof, thank you for the lecture. 
Prof, in the opening statement, um, you made mention that um, borrowing from China vis-a-vis -vis the West is like um, moving from frying pan to fire. And I think in the course of the lecture, you really explain why no transparency and um, most of the loans that came from China is more or less financing Chinese as assets or Chinese exports rather. And then in the long analysis, it's like we, the borrower is actually doing China more favor than um, thought to be done by the loans being borrowed. But my question is, it, is this, is a known fact that um, in some countries that defaulted in the Chinese loans, Sri Lanka, Zambia, and some others, China or Chinese government in one way or the other have tried to seize the uh, finance assets. In Nigeria's case, who says they can't do that here also if Nigeria default in the loan repayments. And then judging from the fact that we are spending already 99% of our revenues in servicing debts, not even the debt itself. 20 years term loan from China, the tenor is running. So who says they cannot equally seize the assets on coming here and do what they've done to the other countries, to, to Nigeria? Thank you. We thank you very much. Um, we normally insist that those who will join us will enter with their names. But um, in the spirit of um, courtesy, let's allow Galaxy A70 to ask questions. Galaxy A70, please, and Hawaii Prime 2009, please get ready. All right. Good afternoon, my brother. Uh, my name is Emisa Irele, and I'm calling from Aberdeen. Rafa, thank you so much. I mean, you've done a wonderful presentation today. And um, what you said clearly state uh, the situation we are in Nigeria. It's not a doubt that those loans were actually borrowed, not for the interest of Nigeria or Nigerians, but for the same corrupt practices. And again, when you check the characteristics of a faith state, these things happening in Nigeria defines what a faith state is. Unemployment, the ratio to subsidy debt and stuff like that. So I want you, without shying away from the truth, to tell us if actually you support the view that Nigeria is actually a failed state based on all this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our last question, please, will come from uh, Hawaii Y9 Prime 2009. Please quickly ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Paul. I'm calling from the Middle East. I work in the oil industry. And um, Prof said something about PPP, which I, uh, I absolutely agree with him. The telecom industry in Nigeria is a typical example of the PPP. So what, what is his view in extending the full regulation of telecom into the downstream of the oil and gas industry? Because that has been a big problem. Secondly, he also said that the real career expenditure is one of the big problems in government. So it means that government is basically too large. So what, what is his view on switching from the um, bogus and expensive presidential style of government to the much more smaller parliamentary um, system of government, which is um, smaller, less, less, uh, less expensive, and uh, less corrupt? the kind of system that is practiced in the United Kingdom we are based into. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Prof. You are... <laughs> Let's see how much justice you'll be able to do to this question before we round up. Yeah, it's a lot of questions, and yeah. I'll just try and give a very short one-line answers. Yes. Yeah. Um, starting with uh, the sovereignty clause. Um, every country has sovereignty, uh, in international law. That is one of the attributes of statehood. Uh, that is why you can send ambassadors and receive ambassadors, and you can have diplomatic immunities because you represent a sovereign if you are an ambassador or so, so on and so forth. Now, but in reality, uh, I find in international law, and I was an, I mean, I'm an international lawyer in addition to being a political economist, I have found that there are sovereigns with a small s and there are sovereigns with a capital S. Um, so sovereigns are not equal in the international system. And because some other, some countries have the indices of power, they have the economic strength, they have technology, and they have military strength, they are far more able to protect their sovereignty than smaller countries. If, for example, a small country has a, a permanent nation at the UN in New York, uh, where I used to work, um, but cannot pay its rent. And its rent is being paid by some big country. Can you seriously assert your sovereignty to that country? If you are dependent on foreign aid 
Can you seriously assert your, your sovereignty to the country that you depend on for it? So let me just say that the sovereignty of many African countries is seriously qualified, even by the realities of the international system today. Second, you can, by your own contractual actions, derogate from your sovereignty. It is your decision. Either you have made it willingly, or you have been coerced into doing so, or you have been conned into doing so. Um, whichever one it is, we don't know. So, for example, if you look at this agreement, it's not a direct seeding of Nigeria's assets. But as I have told you, it is normal in contracts that there will be provisions for some sort of dispute resolution in case a dispute arises. And because people don't, foreign investors don't trust the Nigerian judicial system, they intend to go, they tend to go for uh, international arbitrations. Now, you could negotiate that clause and there could be, and whatever arbitral award that the arbitration rules on, you're bound to pay it because you enter into the contract. But is it necessary for you to agree that an arbitration award could be an attachment on your assets with only two or three exceptions, maybe military assets. That means that if the arbitration rules in the favor of China, either directly that you have to pay a certain sum and you cannot pay that sum, they can come in and take those assets. Or the arbitration can rule that you should give up those assets. So you have signed it in the contract. So it's a kind of, is a, a waiver of, of sovereign immunity, an express waiver, actually. So that's my answer to Bashir. There are different ways that this contract could have been negotiated without violating the basic principle that the Chinese are entitled to judicial recourse if something goes wrong. It's, it's a contract. So you can't say, I'll take a loan, and there's nothing I should be prepared to give up if I can't pay my loan. You cannot take that position. So... So this is the balance of positions, uh, and I hope I have tried to address your question. Now, somebody said, what should, somebody talked about Hong Kong. I'm not very clear. Um, I don't remember the details of that, but you said they're a third party, but a third party is normally not uh, a party to the contract, but it could be a third party beneficiary of the contract. So, but I'm not very sure of the details uh, of, of what you are referring to, but. We all know the, the um, relationship between Hong Kong and China. Um, Hong Kong is a special territory, but it has returned to Chinese sovereignty. It was independent for 99 years, and you know that actually the Opium Wars of 1839 and a few years going forward, where the British captured Hong Kong and the humiliation that the British capture of Hong Kong and where they signed a treaty that Britain will take Hong Kong for 100 years. We know that that humiliation is one of the reasons that gave rise to the Chinese worldview of the rise of China. We will rise. We have a chip on our shoulder. We will not be humiliated again in international affairs the way the British did when we lost the Opium War. We will become a world power and over or overtake the British. So just speaking about Hong Kong, it's important to understand how Hong Kong plays in the psychology of China. So that lease is over, and China is now a part of Hong Kong, albeit under special terms, you know, that it will pursue a capitalist economy and so on and so forth. So it could be a third party beneficiary from this contract, but like I said, I'm not very clear of the details of that. Um, somebody said, what should citizens do? The problem we have in Nigeria is that we don't hold our, our governments accountable as citizens. I remind you that in the early 1960s, there was a pact that the Nigerian government signed with, I think it was the British government, yeah, on something to do with some military uh, base or something. Defense but, agreement. Yes, Defense. but Nigerians rose up in the 1960s and protested against that agreement. So people were even more aware then than today. Today, a lot of things are happening and our citizens have been suppressed. They have been cowed into silence. 
And that's largely because of the economic problems that people are facing. Uh, so they, they focus on, you know, on, on just their livelihood. Uh, some people focus on watching DB Niger to just pass away the time and get a lot of entertainment to drown their sorrows, you know. So we are in a state of anomie, no question about it. So it appears that the power of the people to stand up for their rights when about women protested as far back as how many decades ago. It seems that that power is going lower and lower and lower and becoming smaller and smaller. That's a shame that as time passes in Nigeria, the citizens become weaker and weaker instead of becoming stronger and stronger. So, but I think the citizens should educate themselves and assert themselves. People always say, oh, the police will shoot us, the police will kill us. If one million people come out into the streets, let's just say, in a peaceful protest, Peaceful, not violent. There's nothing the police can do about it because it is your right to protest, as we have seen with the Black Lives Matter, you know, and so on. So I think the citizens also disempower themselves and give themselves a lot of excuses. Um, contract inflation is a norm. How should it be fought? Of course it should be fought. I have proposed a strategy. When I ran in 2019, I gave out a clear way to fight corruption in Nigeria. And there are a number of plans, one of which is transparency about contracts. If a contract, if you maintain an electronic database of every item on the market, and you maintain it in an internet or some database, and it is constantly updated, and every contract is subjected to that database in terms of the pricing, and if the prices of any component are more than 30% of the current price, you know that there is mago mago. You know that there is contract inflation going on. Now, of course, the, the, the contractor must make profit. That's why I give the 30% margin. The contractor is not an NGO. So we need to take this approach to fighting corruption. So it's a more preventive approach. Then, of course, there are issues of impartial accountability, there are issues of paying civil servants in proper living wage, and so on. And then there are issues of leadership. So fighting corruption is a complex issue, but accountability and transparency is a very important part of what we should bring to fighting corruption in order to reduce the inflation of contracts. Um, someone said, four-year term for re-election. Is it enough time? It's not a lot of time. I must tell you, uh, but it's enough time for you to do some things, you know, and but it depends on what you do. That's the issue. You cannot say that because you want to impress the electorate, you sell generations of Nigerians into debt slavery because you want to impress the electorate. No, that's not leadership. Um, there are some things you can do. You can invest a lot more, for example, in social infrastructure, like healthcare, like education, and you can do that in a space of two to three years and people can see some results. So I don't, um, even though I will say that we know that in many countries in Asia that have made a lot of progress, there was a lot of stability in the government. So the leaders lasted a long time, but they were visionary leaders like Mahathir Mohammed of Malaysia. Um, they could maintain a certain consistency of policy because those countries were not ideal democracies in those years. Uh, but we have chosen democracy and we must operate within its limitations. Um, what can be done to stabilize Nigeria's political trajectory? I think there is one major thing that, there are two things that need to be done to stabilize the country's political trajectory. Uh, but the most important is what I referred to, the need for a new constitution for Nigeria. Uh, the need for constitutional restructuring to return Nigeria to a proper federal state. Um, it's a very big country, and that's why it was designed as a federation when we gained independence. And regardless of the challenges, if it had not been for the unfortunate military interventions, I think we would have matured more uh, as, as a democracy. So I think we have to return to a proper federation uh, so that different parts of the, of the country um, you know, can develop at their own pace, and there can be even competitive uh, development. So constitutional restructuring, and then addressing issues of nation building, equity and justice, you know? What is good for the goods is good for the Ganda. 
if you allow any part of the country to feel that they're being marginalized or they're being subjugated, different kinds of uh, agitations will arise, whether it's in the Niger Delta, uh, whether it's in the Middle Belt, whether it's in the Southeast, you know, and these things draw away from the strength of a country. Uh, but that's because the leadership of the political elite has allowed this situation to develop. So it's a failure of leadership uh, that we're suffering from. Um, do I think the loans that we've taken were viable, are viable? Uh, obviously, from my presentation, you can see that I don't think so. So I don't think I'll dwell um, too much on that. Who says Nigeria can't seize Nigeria's assets, like in Sri Lanka? Well, not in a direct way, they can't. They can only do it if that happens within the context of an arbitral award. Um, so that is, the contract deflected that possibility only as an outcome of an arbitration, not as a direct possibility. So, um, but it is possible, you know, in a certain scenario that such a thing could happen if an arbitral award were, were, were given and could not be paid, for example. Um, so then um, deregulation. Um, I believe that we should not only privatize, but we should deregulate. And the telecom industry certainly is a very good example of what we can achieve in our economy uh, if we privatize and deregulate. You know, so, and that's a big achievement. I think that was uh, recorded under the era of uh, Lucia Gunabar Syndrome. Many institutions were created in that era. Uh, a lot of economic reforms were undertaken, including, by the way, a cancellation of Nigeria's foreign debt of about $30 billion. $18, $18 billion repaid, $12 billion canceled. So, um, you know, we know that that was a very huge achievement. And now we are back to a debt crisis again, which is a little bit disappointing. Um, now, presidential or parliamentary system. Well, it's, a, it's an ongoing debate. The presidential system has its, its advantages, a bit more stable, but very expensive. And we have not run it with the maturity with which some other countries have run it. Now, there are various variations, there are different variations of a presidential system that we could still use, like in France, where you have a president and a prime minister, you know, and there's a certain type of division of powers. The president having more powers, but, <coughs> but the prime minister kind of managing the government on a day to day basis. We could also look at that model. Now, a parliamentary uh, government is, is, more, uh, is cheaper to run because everything happens in small localities and then they send their members of parliament to the center. And that's a very good system, but the problem with it is that it has a potential for instability of frequent governments resigning and, you know, so we should always bear things in mind and not jump from frying pan to the fire. If we reform the presidential system properly in a new constitution, we can still get what we want and what we need. Um, so, um, failed state. Um, I think that that is a very interesting question. Is Nigeria a failed state? Now, let me answer that question very honestly. Nigeria is a distressed state. That's, that's clear to me. Has it failed completely? I wouldn't say so. But is it on track to fail if, if some fundamental changes are not made? I think, I think that that seems to be the case. Um, you know, so I even saw this morning that uh, some Wikipedia uh, had sort of added Nigeria to its list of failed states. Uh, but I, I, you know, you can question that, uh, that, that designation. But I think clearly Nigeria is distressed. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's politically distressed. It's, um, um, it's economically distressed. It's foundationally distressed. So it's, it's all about our political will to come together and discuss the terms of the Nigerian Union and how it can work for every part of the country. Um, we should not make any assumptions. People who talk about, oh, one Nigeria, uh, one indivisible, one indissoluble union, they should be aware of history. That there are many countries that started out as one entity, but did not remain so. Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, India and Pakistan, Czechoslovakia, Czech and, and Slovakia. So many countries, there's no inevitability, but in many of these cases, some it happens through war, 
In the case of Slovakia and Czechoslovakia, uh, in the case of Czechoslovakia, it was a peaceful division. Nigerians should be honest with themselves and decide if they want to really be a nation and not just a country in name. That has always been my argument. I think we could be a very powerful, big and strong country as Nigeria, but we have to have a soul. And that means that we have to have a common purpose and a common vision of the future for all of us. Something that rises above the level of the things that divide us. That's a challenge of leadership that we need to meet. But we should be painfully aware of what the, uh, the consequences could be if we fail to do so and stop deluding ourselves. So I think I've touched on every question. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, wow, Prof, we can spend the whole night listening to you. And I must say, your top this topic and your presence has generated one of the most excitements I have observed in this program. There are still many questions being asked. There are still many hands being raised. And unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions. We thought this would last for only 45 minutes, but we have now stayed here for more than 70 minutes, unfortunately. Or fortunately. <laughs> so what we can do is, uh, let me, uh, there are so many comments here, Prof, but I cannot read up, but let me just read one before you go. Emmanuel Osai, why I said, he's still raising up his hand, but unfortunately we cannot take any more hand. He said, in my humble opinion, being referred to as prof doesn't do you justice because of the disconnect between the university and the industry. Professors are people who just lecture and write papers that gather dust. So calling you prof doesn't do you justice. And finally, he suggested, I will not read all he said, will you consider dropping that title? Because what you have said us is far removed from the classroom. This is practical. Well, I want to tell you that uh, in 2015, um, I was appointed a professor of practice in public policy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Now, in academia, mm -hmm. there is, especially in the United States, there's the theoretical professor and there is the professor of practice. The professor of practice is somebody who has established a track record of leadership and so brings that experience together with intellectual knowledge together into a classroom. So I was a professor of practice. If that is any consolation to you, uh, I'm not just uh, some theoretician. Yeah, thank you. I thank you very I much. Mind, I mean, you can call me Kingsley Morrill. I'm not hung up on any title. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'll call you Prof. Thank you very much. It's been a very wonderful engagement. And I hope, in fact, I, my questions about the economy, I cannot ask them again because of the multitude of questions coming up. I hope you will please give us another, op another opportunity to have you on this platform to ask our numerous questions because one of, the, one of the disappointing things about Nigeria is that the citizens have a lot of questions and they have nobody to answer those questions. The government is not able to answer those questions. If I invite a minister to be on the platform, they always give one excuse or the other to appear. And they have no, no press conferences from the president, no press conference from the vice president, no press conference from the prime minister. People are asking questions and nobody answering them. So please, once again, we thank you very much for honoring our invitation. And it's been a very wonderful evening. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, Daniel. Thank you. I, Thank you, everyone. It was very nice to interact with everybody. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Okay. So I can leave now. I hope. <laughs> yes, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah.